What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 240 at block height 651,267 on Sunday, October 4th. So, what's going on, Janine? You as wiped out as I am? Yes, um, I am wiped out. I am very tempted to just fall asleep on the floor right now. <laughs> oh, it's been a long weekend. It's been a long month. Well, for you, yeah. But, um, so, President Trump is clearly going to die of coronavirus. Did you see he made a statement without a tie-on? He's probably choking and can barely breathe. Um, I mean, the only part I heard is that he said something about how his wife was handling it better because she was, quote, slightly younger than him. Which is an understatement because she's 24 years younger than him, but I guess age doesn't matter when you get to be uh, his um, shape. No, 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 no. Slightly. Very slightly younger. Yeah. I, I mean, I tried they, to they avoid are... the politics on the show, but I just couldn't not make a crack on this one. They're both a nice shade of orange. I think hers is a little more natural, though. Oh, you think? I didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Before we get into discussing um, whether or not Trump looked particularly orange during the debate or not. Oh, yes. Man. So drama in Bitcoin land rather than American politics land. So When sure. is there not drama in either? Well, um, in Bitcoin land, there is no drama in that moment before you find out what the new drama is. But yeah, uh, BitMEX um, and all of their holding companies and all of the executive uh, officers have all been indicted for financial fraud. Woo! Fun times. So, and who's behind the indictment? Well, that's just kind of speculation. Uh, I think I'll get into after I go through everything. But uh, can't wait. Yeah. So I have a tall um, glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Samuel Reed, um, the CTO, is actually in custody right now in the u.s i believe he was arrested in boston um a few days ago um and there are also um you know come come take your handcuffed uh orders for arthur hayes uh benjamin dello and gregory dwyer um and yeah this is a uh a really interesting situation especially given the fact that um you know, they're still up and operating and actually altered their daily withdrawal policy to like, I think every eight hours they are processing withdrawals now and intend to just continue operating and fight these indictments. So, um, yeah, you know, before before getting into the specifics of the the actual indictment, I mean, just like this is bitmax versus the u.s government and as of right now um days after this uh, indictment has come out and sam was arrested they're still operating and still processing withdrawals yeah i mean imagine that um you know you you have a monetary system that can't uh, just be seized because a government talked to a bank or something yeah that's a 
That's how it works. Like, I, I'm kind of flabbergasted that their domain hasn't been seized yet. <clears throat> like, because the, the way I'm looking at this is there's the domain, there's the actual servers and the data regarding open trades, <clears throat> and then there's the actual people with the Bitcoin keys. So why haven't they seized the domain? Like, you seize the domain, you seize the servers if you can, um, are they kind of just worried about the fact that if they did that, you just spin up new servers, um, get a new domain and just keep operating? Like, are they not moving forward harder because the U S government is scared of getting massive egg on their face? I have no idea, but I, uh, definitely, uh, find it funny for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. But into the specifics. Um, so they're pretty much looking at the fact that this company has operated since 2014. And it was sometime in 2015 that the CFTC clarified Bitcoin as a commodity purpose <clears throat> or a commodity for uh, purposes of the Commodity Exchange Act and um, regulations for different market platforms that would entail. And, ooh, um, you know, I think uh, I kind of mentioned this when we were talking about uh, BitMEX implementing their KYC procedure a little bit ago. Um, and the indictment goes into the specifics of all of this, too, about how they used to um, just check your IP once when you registered an account. And then after that, they they don't care where your IP is coming from or if you're connecting from an American um, IP address. And they go all through the specifics of that, um, how that was easily circumventable um, by things like VPNs. And they took no steps whatsoever to <clears throat> enable countermeasures for VPNs. They bring up the fact that they used to run a Tor hidden service access point for the market, which kind of made all that impossible. Um, and they go through all of this and their, their argumentation is essentially that because of the fact that they served Americans and took American money for running these types of contracts, they had to register with the CFTC as a commodities futures platform. Um, and the CFTC specifically clarified that in 2015, the year after they started operations, and that at no point did they register, at no point did they engage in any of the required anti-money laundering or KYC protocols. And they point to how they actually structured things like their IP checking and banning as an argument for how they proactively um, conspired and did design their platform to specifically allow users to circumvent those types of checks that they were doing just as a, a, a charade. And um, yeah, um, the the real killer thing here is nailing them with a very sound argument for actively conspiring to not comply with these regulations and many demonstrations of a, a guaranteed knowledge of their requirement to comply with these things. And so frankly, they're looking at restitution, um, you know, money getting carved up and um, potentially up to five years in jail time for financial fraud um, for specifically um, Bank Secrecy Act violations and Commodity Exchange Act violations for, I believe, the financial liabilities they could be facing. But, <clears throat> um, you know, th this indictment also goes into a little specific accusations of knowledge um of americans on the trading platform and specifically makes accusations about the alteration of internal records um as far as um showing a specific accounts country of activity or origin and modifying it 
from the United States to another country. Um, in one case, I believe that charge was leveled at Gregory Dwyer, um, who is alleged to have done this because they're a famous person in Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. as well as have access to um, lots of internal records breaking up trading volume and account data by country of origin and there being specific demarcation of trades from American accounts based on um, IP activity or whatever they were carving those metrics up on. And so if there's evidence to back that up, um, that is cut and dry, like they're boned if they get, um, you know, caught by anybody who will put them in American custody. Um, and it's probably this is going to be the kind of thing that the government really wants to make really harsh examples on. But um, to get to some kind of speculation of mine, um, and I do want to say <clears throat> that this is based solely on looking at time periods mentioned in the indictment um, and allegations against members of BitMEX. Um, being aware of U.S. people trading on the platform. And I can't help but point out that the um, later part of 2018, which comes up quite a lot, um, is around <laughs> when Tone Vase got his BitMEX account shut down for publicly trading um, on a live stream as an American. And so I can't help yeah, can but wonder if that kicked this off or at least was the impetus to get something pre-existing rolling faster. Yeah. Can I, uh, cause I remember when this happened and I thought it was hilarious that someone had managed to clearly be a well-known person by name in the space and had continued to be able to use an account and was clearly a U.S. citizen and somehow got away with this for so long. But to quote the exact tweet that I remember, which is archived, I haven't checked whether it's been deleted, but I had a hard time finding it otherwise. Um, November 12th, 2018, Tone tweeted, just got my bitmex.com account terminated on suspicion of being a U.S. citizen. Anyone else find the timing of this odd? The 900 plus affiliates that accounted for half of my income are gone going forward. Um, and then there was another tweet, one second, which I am not completely sure if it's i think it is related to bitmex his bitmex account being closed as well but this was on november 19th 2018 and he said just for the record made one bitcoin trade salt a i was forced to exit my trades at a loss i lost 50 percent of my income for 2019 c i may have encountered legal liability and now looking at how much to allocate for a legal team conclusion fuck off um <laughs> so yes um the timing and it all would work out very well. Um, so if anyone knows anything more about this, um, would be very interested to hear. Yeah. I mean, like it, it could wind up just being a coincidence or what happened with tone is just one of many pieces of evidence or things involved here but i just could not help instantly making that connection when i started thinking about those time periods reading through the indictment like i i think that is a road if true to being a very hated bitcoiner but yeah i mean ultimately um I'm going to start memeing constantly on Twitter is bitmax.com seized yet because as far as I'm concerned, this whole situation is a very interesting test. Um, this is going to show really how government resistant a Bitcoin only business whose only real need for infrastructure is servers somewhere um, can be. And I think that's going to be a very interesting test in terms of you know what types of doors that opens in the future for other types of organizations to model themselves to be that government resistant
if bitmax actually can be to some significant degree here like to to just be a callous dick um you know no matter what happens here like this is going to be a major learning experience for organizations that want to set them um selves up to be that resistant against governments my only other comment on this story is that I find it particularly interesting that certain exchanges that are either suspected to be under the microscope of the U.S. government or are being actively investigated by the U.S. government tend to engage in charitable behavior <laughs> in terms of giving their money out. Um, just something that I've noticed recently, not to say whether it's good or bad, I would just caution anyone who maybe gets offered a boatload of money by an exchange that uh, may be involved in a controversy that uh, the reason you're getting the money may not be because you're doing good work or that they actually want to invest in your business. You may just be being used as a bucket um, to get their money out of a business that may have issues. Very real possibility, but I don't know. I just really cannot get out of my head if BitMax can keep up and running with government pressure like this, then that opens interesting doors for all types of businesses or entities this century who like they don't you don't have to be ex in exchange, just only use Bitcoin and only really need servers somewhere to like operate whatever you're doing so exciting speaking of exciting though um you you did a thing um yesterday without really announcing or showing it anywhere well i did as of two hours ago but so basically i got a rather short notice invitation um to interview Harry Halpin, who we've already interviewed on Block Digest in one of the special editions about NIM. And uh, also this interview was also supposed to be about NIM and mixed nets in general. And then there was the mention of Assange as well to do that as a topic because, um, you know, he's he's done like joint interviews with John Shipton and stuff. So he is interested in the Julian Assange case and the trial that uh, the extradition trial that's been happening in the last month. And so that fit in very well. And then um, I don't know exactly how, but it ended up being that the person I interviewed was not Harry Halpin. It was Jacob Applebaum. And so we talked for two hours. Um, as I said on Twitter about uh, the extradition trial, privacy, Bitcoin, scientific journalism, and financial surveillance. And it sounds like everyone really liked it. Um, I think it was probably a bit a bit of a surprise for people that it was even happening because it kind of got added to the schedule late. It wasn't really announced. Um, neither of us were even speakers on uh, the website or anything. So it was arranged very last minute, um, but I think it went very well. Um, so that's uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's like you, you guys really did a perfect job of plumbing through everything and not only just giving context to like Julian's situation, but just showing that aside from that, there is so much scope and precedent far beyond just julian going on here like you guys really did like perfect justice to like the the scope and the context to like both sides of that yeah um because like i said it happened very last minute and so basically i stayed up the night before just um thinking of things to say <laughs> so i'm glad that it uh turned out well and uh thanks to max hillebrand he was the one who originally reached out to me um from hcpp to do this and originally i was under the impression that i would be a co-host and then i turned into the soul host because the actual meat space room that uh the live stream was kind of 
broadcasting from or into was empty for about half the time uh and then our session got extended by another hour so i ended up being a sole host um but it went well despite all of the pressure i mean it really it like seriously uh the instant they get things actually clipped into like individual segments uh I'm gonna I'm gonna reshill things again. Mm-hmm. Is like the that that is like the perfect thing to put somebody in front of who knows who Julian Assange is but doesn't really know much about him. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think um I mean I tried very hard, at least in the beginning, to make sure that I gave a straightforward update of just, you know, who who these people are um what's been happening with the assange case and then we ended up expanding um particularly in the second hour into things that um because my my plan what i wanted to do when i knew this interview was happening was i wanted um a chunk of it to be sort of like what would assange say um because he is unable to speak and that was kind of inspired by this um sculpture that's been going around for a number of years called anything to say um which is basically a sculpture uh with statues of assange and snowden and chelsea manning standing on chairs and there's a fourth chair that um wherever the sculpture is placed uh it like i said it travels around it's been uh in london in berlin um and other cities in germany and it basically is a very interactive sculpture because you stand on the chair and the idea is that you say something that um, either about them, about how much you appreciate them, or you say you just say something that you normally wouldn't have the courage to say. And so I feel like I was kind of inspired by that and wanted part of the session to be like talking about ideas that need to get out there that he would care about um that he is unfortunately unable to participate in the conversation mm -hmm. yeah that was a really nice bit in there i, I don't want i don't want to spoil the whole thing you know the second we're done with this i'm gonna i'm gonna go retweet that from the digest account if you haven't already uh well like i said i put it out two hours ago because i was just uh i actually had to do work yesterday and i was just so brain dead tired that i um didn't do that uh so but yeah i have the people who were there um in person or watching remotely seemed to really enjoy it so i was good with that and i didn't feel like i needed to push it too much oh but we will we will yeah um someone in the chat mentioned the uh yeah one of the things i brought up was ultrasound beacons for cross device tracking um which as i said in the session uh when you first hear that you think that sounds nuts what is that but literally all it is is something on a web page usually an advertisement that make a noise that you can't hear that communicates to another device um your phone could even be one of these like home uh, iot devices like google or google home or alexa and it basically just it tells the device to do things and what it usually tells the device to do is to kind of just give information or i i'm not uh i can't re entirely remember all the different mechanisms of how it works but it basically just tries to get information about what other devices are in proximity to the one that the ad is playing on and it can figure out well these are your devices or they're nearby which means they're probably yours or there's someone they belong to someone who lives with you or you hang out with and on that basis they can then serve you more advertising in a more targeted fashion and it's all ad tech stuff um this is stuff that like uh you know go to ad tech com conferences or as he said um to their surveillance conferences um and you will find them talking about this and how exciting it is and woo we can do more advertising and it's not it's not crazy nut job world it's it's advertisers it's google it's all of these people and it's happening and people aren't really aware of it yep makes me really look forward to the day that i can have a linux phone good enough to plug into a desktop that has kill switches for literally everything. Mm-hmm.
Already though. Want want to slide into a victory against the stupid patent system? Yes, I do. So, uh, on the twenty fifth, Peter Woolley uh, tweeted out a very vague um, U.S. patent number seven million one hundred and ten thousand five hundred and thirty eight has expired, and uh, this turns out to be a very interesting rabbit hole in terms of uh, verifying cryptographic signatures. So, um. I'm going to keep this as high level as I can, but pretty much the gist here is verifying a signature is just multiplying points. And when you're dealing with like graphs and curves, you can pretty much map one set of data to something else. And the trick here is what's called, that's called a morphism. And an endomorphism is when you map something to itself. And there's kind of where my head starts hurting even. Um, but the idea is that sometimes on certain curves, that type of trick and operation um, can be less expensive than the point multiplication or even worth it if it's not less expensive in terms of CPUs. And apparently Hal Finney, um, back in like 2011, um, was talking about this type of trick um, to speed up signature verification. And it was built into uh, libsec P256K1 from the very beginning and just deactivated because a patent was on this. And um, now that that patent has revealed, um, we can flip that on now. Um, without any developers or people using that um, being at risk for patent violations. And uh, Jamison Lopp um, ran some tests on this um, that back up uh, Finney's back in the day, um, showing 25% increase in uh, signature verification speed up. So this is just a massive win in terms of one, initially bootstrapping the blockchain and then two um resource consumption to keep up with things um and yeah um my mind is kind of blown by the fact that this was just there to turn on and developers were watching for this because <laughs> i i had no clue a concept like this existed before peter tweeted that yeah so for anyone who doesn't know the patent um Shinobi gave the number, and the title is Method for Accelerating Cryptographic Operations on Elliptic Curves, uh, and it was dated September 2006. So it's like, I, it really has me wondering, like, what kind of other stupid things like this speed up trick or schnorr um, that are kind of hidden behind patents now so we can't achieve optimizations that we otherwise could. Peter Wool will tell us when the time is right. <laughs> I'm just imagining like a secret IRC room now where like the developers just conspire in private about like patents like this and just getting paper <laughs> when they expire. They're not wizards. They're just reverse patent trolls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a... Uh, yeah. I, I'm half tempted to just compile this myself and switch it on rather than waiting for a release, but I am really excited to see um, what this does in the long term as far as node numbers over like the next year or so, say. Alrighty, though. I think next up are two countries being douchebags, if I do remember correctly. Yes, uh, the the tax uh, business is full of douchebags. Um, so according to a report by RNZ, which I think is probably representing Radio Nor Radio New Zealand, I almost said Radio Norway, <laughs> completely wrong country, um, the Inland Revenue Department, or IRD, which is basically the New Zealand equivalent of the US IRS or the British HMRC, which we will get to next, uh, is requesting that cryptocurrency businesses based in New Zealand, or I, I didn't quite check 
it might also be businesses that serve New Zealanders, um, but they've said that they must provide them with customer details as well as the type and value of crypto assets that they either have in their account or purchase. And so it says the IRD is requesting this information to enhance our understanding of the crypto asset environment in New Zealand so we can work out how best to help taxpayers meet their income tax obligations. Ah, uh, yes, they want to be helpful. Um, tax man always wants to help. And then the article uh, then includes some comments from business owners and response to this request, uh, one of which is the chief executive of Easy Crypto, who, um, uh, well, has my namesake, uh, Janine Gr uh, Granger, and uh, she said that she was disappointed by the request, but not surprised. Um, I guess IRD is just widening its net of the tax base, and crypto assets are something that is definitely growing in popularity, and we're seeing a huge increase in New Zealanders getting involved. However, she said the requirement to hand over customers' personal information was heartbreaking. Oh, jeez. More, more than my namesake. Privacy is really important to us. One of the tenets of cryptocurrency in general is about having freedom and autonomy and privacy. While many people might think, I have nothing to hide, therefore why do, what do I care? The point of privacy isn't to aid people who have nothing to hide. It's to ensure we have a fair, open, and free society. Yes. Um... Granger uh, said Easy Crypto would comply with the IRD's request after it found there was no legal grounds to refuse handling, um, handing over that information. IRD says that in the early stages of its inquiry, and it's too early to say what the response had been amongst firms, if taxpayers were concerned that they had not met their tax obligations, they could make a voluntary disclosure to the IRD. Yes, uh, oh yes, the good voluntary disclosures, the um, kind of like um please don't hurt me type uh form filling that we love because everyone knows uh taxes are not voluntary it's not a voluntary disclosure when you're being coerced but good try yeah see this is kind of why i like living in the united states despite all of the big problems here um even the IRS here has some kind of restrictions and limitations in terms of just going around and grabbing literally everybody's data for no reason. And I really think like tax authorities where there are not legal restrictions for things like that are about to start going ham for the next year or two. I'm sorry, but I can't believe that you just said you were thankful to be under the purview of the IRS. Um, because as an American citizen, you have the added benefit of not being able to live anywhere else without being subject to U.S. taxes all the time. So I can't exactly share that sentiment. <laughs> hey, my slave driver tells the IRS back the fuck off when they do shit like that. You got to limit it to the rich people. Yeah, well, uh, you know, referencing that Hannah Arendt quote that I um, gave out yesterday about uh, choosing your oppressor, everyone wants to oppress you, and maybe political refugees have the worst situation where no one wants to oppress them, and so everyone does. Um, that is my only comment. I wonder what percentage of viewers are going to get this, but I'm somebody's bitch! Guess better to choose who you're the bitch of than be everyone's bitch. <laughs> that being said should we go on to the next bitch or the next uh, government that everyone is a bitch of sounds good so uh, decrypt has published an email that uh, coinbase customers uh, at least the ones based in the uk or uk citizens may have recently received it's not clear there's no date in the screenshot but it was apparently received in response to a request from HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Uh, again, the equivalent of the US IRS, but worse because there's a queen involved um, and she has her name on everything. The email states, uh, we're writing to let you know about a notice uh, HMRC issued to Coinbase under paragraph one, schedule 23, because obviously people are familiar with these things. And they're actually going to look it up uh, to the Finance Act 2011. This notice uh, requires us to provide information on your Coinbase account to HMRC. The original notice that we received from HMRC required Coinbase to provide certain records from 2017 to 2019 
relating to all customers of our UK business. Based on further discussions with HMRC, a revised notice with reduced scope was issued that now requires the disclosure of customers with a UK address who received more than £5,000 worth of crypto assets on the Coinbase platform during the course of the 2019-2020 tax years. And 2020 is not even over yet. This includes both purchases or receipts of crypto to your Coinbase account. We would encourage you to consult with your tax or legal advisor with any questions you may have regarding tax matters and your Coinbase activity, account activity. Uh, HMRC has advised Coinbase that there is published guidance from HMRC on the taxation of crypto assets, which can be found here. Additionally, you may prefer to submit a disclosure. Ooh, look, disclosure, again, using the Digital Disclosure Service, DDS. That sounds very close to, um, I, I, for acronyms. Anyway, um, which gives individuals and companies a chance to bring their tax affairs up to date. Yes. Um, yeah, so... I noticed that Decrypt in this article and some other people are saying, oh, look, they reduced the request. They'll only be getting information on people who received or bought a lot of cryptocurrency. But guys, um, seriously, do you not know how tax offices function? They are more than willing to, uh, is to include a minimum threshold to the point that... Um, they have because anything less than that, anything less than 5,000 pounds is probably not going to be very useful to them in terms of getting revenue from taxes because they are more likely to spend more resources investigating people who bought um, tens or hundreds of dollars worth than they are to actually get from those people in taxes. It makes no economic sense. They, they of course, don't like people who aren't following tax rules but when it comes to there they want to commit a bunch of resources to investigating people doing that they're going to wait until the amount is significant enough where they can pretty much guarantee that they're going to get money from you um so yes did they reduce the request yeah but it's not like they didn't give coinbase that big of a bone at the end of the day it benefits them to not have to deal with tiny tiny amounts of cryptocurrency and just have a minimum that they look into that that just it makes sense from the state's perspective to do that it's not a favor <laughs> i just cannot get the dystopian image out of my head of tax services effectively just becoming bitcoin bounty hunters in the next decade or two you don't think that they're already that no, I just mean, think about it. Um, governments just start printing fiat. Um, that becomes mostly irrelevant for tax base. So what does somebody like the IRS do? Let's go find the Bitcoiners and get some of that stuff. Ah, boy. All right. I say we bring some positivity into this episode. I am very positive about taxes. I think it's wonderful. I'm somebody's bitch. We're both bitches of the U.S. no matter where we go. But that means you have rights. More like liabilities. Sometimes. Already, though. But let's go to another state. Maybe. So this is something neato that I've been waiting for a while to see somebody do. Um... A South and Central American um, company, Crypto Buyer, um, has set up in uh, Valencia, I believe, in Venezuela, a um, node hooked up to the Blockstream satellite feed. And pretty much they're going to blast it out um, on a mesh network, everything that comes down the satellite feed. And they have plans um, in the near future to expand and set up nodes in uh, Caracas, the, the capital, and uh, the southern state of Bolivar. And pretty much just keep building out this infrastructure of satellite nodes getting um, the data through Blockstream's feeds and making that freely available in local mesh networks as a broadcast. So... This is, is fucking goddamn cool. And 
I really don't care what anybody says in terms of most actual Venezuelans don't touch or deal with Bitcoin. Um, like there is infrastructure down there being set up at such a rapid pace to make that so easy to change. I mean, at, at this point, if things like this build out, um, the, the Loka mesh devices, um, actually succeed and come to market at scale, like you're, you're talking just open mesh infrastructure scattered through Venezuela that nobody can be locked out of that any anybody could just be a bitcoin bank for somebody down there and like they are really taking this kind of infrastructure more seriously than any other community i've seen of like bitcoiners in terms of uh like nationality or like a geographic area like i i really can't think of anywhere else on earth where there is as much progress being made on this type of like decentralized physical infrastructure for stuff i mean like you know the the recent like national mining pool and registry stuff janine um what if you could use stuff like this to um try and not comply with that yeah. Go do it. Hack the planet. Ah, it's like Venezuela is not a very stable um country right now, but they are really building the seeds for a cyberpunk utopia as opposed to dystopia. All right. It's autism time. Oh goody. So Blockstream has recently, um, I think a couple weeks ago, um, finished a implementation of the simplicity language for uh, the Element sidechain platform. And they just published something going through um, some of the new fun stuff um, coming out of this. Uh, so pretty much the structure of a simplicity address is pretty much the same kind of thing as pay to script hash with uh, mast. So like the Merkle tree script commitment um, buried under taproot. And that's the kind of general structure. So all addresses are the same size, just a hash of the tree with different scripts in them. Um, but they have introduced a, um, a new function called the the disconnect combinator and the interesting thing here is you can take a script and break half of it up and include half of it in that that masked merkle tree commitment but not the other half and pretty much disconnect a part of the the script from that merkle tree to make it freely programmable and just something you plug in with the witness when you go to spend it. And so the first really fucking cool thing they've built here um, is a, a universal um, SIG hash system. So you, you can pretty much use the that disconnect combinator um to build a completely custom um sig hash mode so like the the signature hash um in the actual signature dictates what part of the transaction that's committing to like sig hash all all the inputs and outputs um sig hash single like just one input and the corresponding output um you know you can do that to just sign inputs the the any previous output um script uh, or sig hash flag if we get that would allow you to just sign the, the script now this allows you to just customize and dictate whatever parts of the the transaction you want to sign so pretty much um with simplicity using this um you can just do sig hash any previous output right now you could make any kind of custom sig hash commitments what parts of the transaction you're actually committing to that you want 
And so that just opens a crazy door potentially in terms of second layer development using simplicity. Like you can just see without SIG hash um, any previous output, how much more limited Lightning Network is and how much more flexible that would make it. You can just create any kind of SIG hash setup that you want. Um, they've also um, structured things so that you can pretty much do a delegation where with that second half of, the, of a script, I could take the signing key that is there by default and delegate with that second half or half of the script that you can freely program and plug in the ability to spend, um, you know, coins to your key. And I would still be able to go spend that at any time, but until I spend to a different thing where you are not delegated control, you could spend that as well. And this actually would also allow, um, you know, requiring and including things like a specific change output. So I could delegate you um, some of my money without moving anything on chain, but guarantee that you can't take the entire UTXO out or like just completely yourself. And you can also use the way that you disconnect half of a script um, to do loops. So you could effectively take that second half of the script and replicate the first half and then do that again and nest that to perform loops. And so like really, um, I am like fucking 10 times more excited about simplicity in terms of just thinking like if, if this rolls out to um, liquid, um, that's kind of like a, a fucking science playground in terms of what types of layers and, and structures could be built there and then looked at and, and thought about in terms of like, how do we safely replicate this on the main layer now? So like this, this is 10 out of 10 autism. Epic. What, what exactly makes it autistic exactly? Is it the no eye contact? Is it the um obsessions what, what is it <laughs> it's the hyper nerdy details and the implications of them like that just the the flexibility of that is so many things that are just possible to do completely custom by default that on the main chain everything would require a new fork <laughs> like that sounds to me like battle tested and proven to not have any errors or problems in the long term sounds like the absolute perfect capstone for bitcoin upgrades if possible Woo. but i think we are done with the positive break and back to talking about who is whose bitch yeah so i think i already mentioned this in a prior episode but this month um yeah there well i've i think i brought it up on two shows now because there's been two requests but the irs has put out another or had put out another request for basically someone who could break lightning privacy monero privacy any privacy to do with cryptocurrencies and they want a tool for this. And uh, the request came from the cyber crimes uh, unit of the, the or, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of pieces to the IRS. Cyber crimes portion of the IRS uh, under the, well, I, I noted in my newsletter that the current cyber crimes or cyber or criminal, so it's the cyber crimes unit of the criminal investigation division and the chief, the current chief is Don Ford, although I think by now he's been replaced by a different guy who was the deputy director, James Lee. Um, he's going to be replaced in October, might have already happened. And then the director of cyber crimes is Michael T. Bat Batdorf. Um, 
And basically, the IRS offered, uh, with a deadline of September 16th, that someone would apply to build this tool for them, and in exchange, they would get no more than $500,000 to develop a proof of concept, and then they would get an additional 125000 for testing and piloting and deployment and stuff like that. And so it looked like, as of September 30th, that the contract was awarded to none other than Chain Alice. It was also, uh, this was a joint award, um, it get, it was awarded also to another company called Integra FEC LLC, which is, there's a bunch of Integra companies, and this is pr- either the main one or something. I haven't looked up what the different functions of the companies are, but they're kind of in a group uh, owned by this one guy, and a uh basically what they they say they do is that they're a forensic data analytics firm that assists government agencies and law firms with investigations litigation and enforcement related to securities and financial fraud so it's a match made in heaven uh chain analysis and integra um with their no integrity um so this will probably work out very well whether they can actually do any of the things the irs actually wants is still an open question but no surprise that chain analysis would be willing to be the IRS's bitch. Yep. But now we are going to get a very nice insight into how competently they are handling um, more complicated privacy things or second layers um, based on whether or not in a year or two we start seeing door knocks for stuff like that. Well, uh, as someone said yesterday during uh the session um i would apply the um (laughs) the strategy that um was applied to marketers in this context of what we should do with these two companies i believe his name was hicks all right now don't don't get us kicked off our our platforms now yeah, yeah. Well, technically, it's a nonviolent crime because it's done on the self. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> Alrighty, though. Uh, this next one is not really much more than just a quick update because I think this was kind of obvious, at least in the explicit sense. Um, since OFAC went and sanctioned some uh, Bitcoin addresses because of Iran. Um, But the Department of the Treasury um, has put out a few page clarification letter um, pretty much explicitly confirming that any type of ransomware payment to a sanctioned entity um, will constitute um, a violation of OFAC sanctions. And they even go so far as to explicitly point out weird interactions where, um, say, a non-U.S. person is facilitating the actions of a U.S. person or vice versa um, in a situation where a party is not even aware that they are violating OFAC sanctions, um, they are still liable, um, still um, prohibited from that, and still um, subject to civil penalties. So pretty much even if you have absolutely no clue um, that you are dealing with a sanctioned entity, um, you can still get bent over and fined and deal with consequences for that. And they pretty much end it um, explicitly stating um, contact the relevant government authorities in the instance of any um, ransomware compromise. And pretty much just list the relevant divisions of the Treasury Department and then the FBI and cyber fraud divisions of Homeland Security. So um, I like how you almost said irrelevant. The irrelevant government entities. Maybe I did. But um, yeah, so this is going to get really interesting for anybody subject to ransomware attacks, no matter how valuable or critical whatever took offline is, because um, yeah, now it's explicitly stated um, you're going to get in big shit if you wind up trying to pay that. I could very well see this biting. Um, 
people in the United States very hard in the ass. Um, Cause it's like, you know, we, we don't really cover every instance of ransomware like we used to maybe a year or two ago, but like, they're still out there. Like there is still, you know, systems, whether private or public getting hit with ransomware all the time. And if they have, they've pretty much just completely removed the option to pay. So that's going to have a lot of consequences going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get through this next one as fast as possible, Janine, or I might vomit. Oh, is it my turn now? Yeah, it's the mission. I see. So, um, yes, on September 27th, Brian Armstrong blogged on Coinbase that, uh, quote, Coinbase is a mission-focused company. And he opens by saying, there have been a lot of difficult events in the world this year, a global pandemic, shelter in place, social unwest, un unwest, <laughs> widespread protests and riots and West Coast wildfires. There seems to be additional bad news every day, including the recent events regarding Breonna Taylor. But just a side note here, I love the fact way he just kind of name drops Brianna Taylor and implies that it was a recent event when it happened months ago, you know, what, <laughs> but whatever. Um, off of that, uh, if you don't get the joke, um, there seems to be kind of a problem with Brian Armstrong making statements about, you know, Black Lives Matter, but that's another topic. Um, on top of that, uh, we have a contentious U.S. election on the horizon. This is continued with the quote. Um, everyone is asking the question about how companies should engage in broader societal issues during these difficult times while keeping their teams united and focused on the mission. Coinbase has had its own challenges here, including employee walkouts, also employee firings, if you know what I mean. Um, I decided to share publicly how I'm addressing this in case it helps others navigate a path through these challenging times. Um, and then he goes on to explain that the company goals include putting the company's goals. <laughs> Imagine that one of your company goals is putting the company's goals ahead of any particular team or individual goals. Um, also, assuming positive intent amongst our teammates and assuming ignorance over malice. You know, not, you know, not bad stuff. Um, we have each other's backs. Focusing on what we have in common, not where we disagree, especially when it's unrelated to our work. You know, all kind of just standard issue stuff. But then there's a sec section of the post that seems to have caught people's attention where he explains what to do in relation to societal issues and political causes. Um, for broader societal issues, he says, we don't engage here when issues are unrelated to our core mission because we believe impact only comes with focus. And then for political causes... We don't advocate for any particular causes or candidates internally that are unrelated to our mission because it, 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 it is a distraction from our mission. Even if we all agree something is a problem, we may not all agree on the solution. One second while I scroll. Um, I had to scroll because there is a big ass quote where he says, but for some employees working at an activism focused company may be core to what they want. We want to prompt that conversation with their manager to help them get a better get to a better place <laughs> it's so passive aggressive life is too short to work somewhere that you aren't excited about and we're happy to make that a win-win conversation <laughs> oh this is so great this language um now anyway um so i'm not someone who has worked or would work ever at coinbase um and i'm assuming that based on you know what Brian said in his interview with Peter McCormick in July, uh, he probably considers me to be one of these noisy activist people who make his business difficult by pointing out that he acquired former upper management of hacking team um, and not didn't really do any due diligence on that whatsoever or maybe just gave up on his values completely. But uh, anyway, a lot of people who have spoken out over the years at Facebook or Google or Amazon about those companies' contracts and relationships with various governments, including states that engage in human rights violations, are also branded as activists or focused on activism. And again, they are considered noisy people who make the company lose focus, too. And, you know, in general, I first want to say this is all very, like, you know, 
nothing super controversial in what he said like wanting people to be happy and calm at work is not something that should be controversial in general but what i take issue with is this idea that coinbase is a non-political company or that brian is not bringing politics into his business because because if they genuine that, then they have no business and no ability to uh, further their goal of so-called financial inclusion. Financial inclusion, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is very much rooted in politics. Who is allowed to use money where and when is a political matter because the state determines so much of the monetary system relations that people must follow, which may cut them off completely if they disagree. So the idea that you can literally name your business after a type of transaction that creates new units of money in a revolutionary digital cash system where people can achieve financial independence and control from the state uh, and think that you can remain politically unengaged is kind of laughable to me. It's also a lie because they just, you know, recently sent chief legal officer Brian Brooks to be lead of the OCC. So if you think there's not a political revolving door again, on the other side of the coin, here's where I shit on both sides. Um, there is definitely um, activism uh, or at least sounds like there's some activism going on in Coinbase that I find be, how should I put it, precious. There is a story <laughs> um, recently published in Business Insider um, that says Coinbase's office used to have signs indicating employees can use uh, the bathroom where they feel most comfortable. Those signs were deemed too political and were removed, former employees tell me. Now, I like gender neutral bathrooms uh baseline like i think it's a good idea and the fact that someone took down signs you know that's not good but on the other hand i find it extremely and i also understand that coinbase people are kind of obsessed with dumping their shit coins um which explains this story <laughs> um but <laughs> I just want to say that as a person who tried to actively um, get more information and help people inside Coinbase to maybe talk about the fact that that their company hired former hacking team people who literally got a journalist killed. They helped a foreign government to get a journalist killed uh, at one point or trained the people who got him killed. Uh, with tools and training. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious. Um, at what point does that... At what point do people at Coinbase get upset about that enough to come forward to the same extent as bathroom signs being removed? Because I don't know. Like... Yes, I would I would feel unsafe in a company that wouldn't just let me go and shit in the bathroom or make that some kind of political issue uh, where I can't do that. That would make me uncomfortable. But, you know, it would also make me uncomfortable working in the same office as hacking team. You know, just I'm just kind of wondering um, where the priorities of these people are uh, to you know, stay silent on one issue that actually affects a ton of people, um, including black lives, which they claim to care about in other instances. Uh, but then on the other hand, not uh, <laughs> ha having a big problem with this bathroom situation. Like what it, it feels like such a like the the kind of activism that i'm seeing so far that people are trying to defend sounds like a very privileged kind of activism where you only care about the internal politics of the office but you don't care if you bring in people who have literally had political effects in other parts of the world that affect way more people than anyone who's ever going to use your office bathroom uh so i'm just wondering where the priorities are here and you know i am still open as i've said before if there are any people from coinbase who would like to whistleblow about the hacking team issue because i'm sure there's more to be said on that subject i will not make fun of you i will keep uh conversations confidential 
Um, I just feel like if you're going to whistle blow, um, <laughs> pick your issue. Firstly, fuck Coinbase. Secondly, um, I have to agree with Brian here. Um, if there is a place for activism at Coinbase, it is of the variety of bringing financial access to people. Um, weird bullshit front groups like BLM, um, that has no place being brought into a, a business or a workplace or personal politics being made, made a football in a business where you, you pretty much have to just comply with the, the wishes or the attitudes of whoever won the game. Like I entirely agree with them there. Um, and I will reiterate fuck Coinbase because they've never actually done a substantial fucking thing to be activistic in that way, which their company should be. But I entirely agree with them. Like fuck that shit. If you want to bring politics into a business like that and turn it into a submit to the mob mentality or have the business be disrupted, um, there's the door. Also, I am once again confused um, because I agree. Um, it is very clear to me that Black Lives Matter does not fit in Coinbase. And part of the reason is that Coinbase is, you know, kind of trying to get a deal with the DEA. And the DEA, um, in case anyone doesn't know, I'm sure uh, a large uh, portion of the population in the United States does, but um, the DEA is not very friendly to black lives. As I've pointed out when Brian originally made that statement, that apparently was coerced out of him. Um, according to some of the reports from people whistleblowing. So yeah, um, Black Lives Matter doesn't belong in Coinbase because at the end of the day, um, the very agencies that are hurting that community are trying to team up with this company. Um, so good luck with that. I mean, you can use all the hashtags you want, but the DEA is still going to ruin entire cities, entire communities with their policies in the drug war. I don't think BLM belongs anywhere. Like, say what you want about that phrase or the message behind it, but that organization is a bunch of psychotic Marxist lunatics. Um, who just destroy shit and that should not be given a platform or legitimized you want to talk about about race about disparity about issues with the police fine but that organization does not represent those things it uses those things as cover for the exact same type of damaging shit we've been seeing all fucking summer in this country Yes, well, there is the organization and the attempt to make a brand, and then there is the underlying sentiment, but yes. That's my point, though, is like a company making that statement reinforces that organization and their brand. And that's why like, I, I, I have to say, like, fuck Coinbase, but I entirely agree with Brian here. I agree that Brian is a milked toast CEO. Well, he found one thing to grow a spine on. I wish it would have been, you know, actually trying to push Bitcoin as a, you know, a new on ramp for people, but milk toast indeed. Alrighty. So. I actually found an interesting thing in light of the recent uh, BitMEX shenanigans. So, um, a company, Seven Labs, has been building out a non custodial exchange on top of Liquid. And pretty much the gist of it is just a coordination and messaging protocol uh, where market makers can come in and set up uh, markets based on pre-signed um, transactions between different assets on liquid. So that kind of sets itself up that somebody could come in, um, add their inputs and outputs to that, um, 
matching to what the other side set up, sign it, and atomically complete an order. And so really all you would need here is kind of a messaging system or a coordination point and people could just freely atomically uh, engage in spot trades here. And honestly, I am really fucking psyched about this and kind of shocked that it has taken this long, given that, um, you know, this is half of what that network was designed for is not just arbitrage between centralized exchanges, but the ability to directly trade any of the assets on the platform atomically on chain. And so like right now, this is just kind of a, a spec being built out that's just looking at the basic messaging protocol, swap protocol, and then the, the trade protocol to handle individual swaps um, for pretty much spot markets. But when that's done, um, there's actually a decent amount of progress being made in terms of uh, spec for discrete log contracts. So there's no reason that you couldn't plug those into something like this um, with an Oracle and then do derivatives as well. So this is going to be really interesting keeping an eye on in parallel with uh, how BitMEX handles uh, what they're dealing with right now. Because ultimately, um, you know, if you trust the consensus model of Liquid, you can do a lot more distributed stuff um, with just a coordination point necessary and not necessarily a business that has to be the same people or ever actually custody coins that anybody could go after. So yeah, let's see if we can uh, get some of the, the stupid Uniswap shit off the stupid chain. But so I, I, I have since been told by a lawyer that decentralized exchanges don't exist well semantically they don't because you still need that point for um coordination and like putting orders up but everything aside from that can be decentralized i'd still count that as a massive win and censorship resistance gain i have to say i am very confused by DeFi as a it's not quite an acronym, it is an acronym, but I'm very confused by it because I struggle to tell sometimes whether it's an Ethereum DeFi thing or someone just abbreviating decentralized finance. I'm very confused. I wish it there is, would be more that, consensus. That's, that's what it means, and it's an oxymoron because financing things literally requires trust. <laughs> that's what finance is. DeFi, DeFi. See, DeFi is a meme. What people need to uh, think about is decentralized trades. Alrighty, though. Um, capstone of the episode. So over um, the Magical Crypto Conference, um, Blockstream announced a brand new wallet called Aqua. Um, for on-chain um, and liquid uh, Bitcoin and asset access. And um, honestly, why? <laughs> like, it's the most simple, like zero features available wallet I have ever seen with a buy Bitcoin option directly in the app through credit cards and Apple Pay. Oh, uh, like there, there we is, need more of that. There is literally like zero functionality here. Um, it's just click the asset, send sell. There's like no functionality or control of anything in the, the settings. Um, like just one... Um, I think that is like the exact wrong way to be going in terms of user interface and user experience. There are things that if you're going to manage your own Bitcoin, you need to grasp about Bitcoin or there are going to be consequences of that. And two, it's like, what, like they have Blockstream Green, 
which is really solid. Um, they just need to get single SIG addresses on that. Like, why the hell did they just make a completely different wallet? Like, green already supports liquid. Like, I I just don't understand what the point of this was. I don't either. Maybe the point was just that we talk about it on as the last story of the season finale. Well, I rate it a bad wallet. Work I rate one on it, green. I rate it so bad that I have not even looked at it. That's how I rate it. Yeah, I just think this is a, a bad resource allocation when they already have a pretty solid wallet that had liquid support. So, yeah. I guess the the last the last official story comment for the season is what were you thinking? Well, uh, the same question could be asked of very similar people about INX, and I'm still asking that question. Yeah. Well, tear us apart. <laughs> well, I guess that is a, a wrap for the season. Uh, got a final thought to go out on? I do, and it's quite a long one, so if you have one, um, I would say you should go first. Struggling to find one, so go for it. All right, so given uh, what has happened in the last month and that this is the season finale, I want to leave off with an aspire, uh, inspiring quote that uh, Stella Morris tweeted out today from Assange. I'm not completely sure where it was given. I think it might have been from like a Munich event that he spoke at. I'm not sure. That's where I saw a transcript of this, but... Um, the clip that she tweeted out, I'm just going to read what he said, which is, There are some consolations to being arbitrarily detained. There is some luck in being an accused person. Luck in being accused of being a spy, a terrorist. Luck in being accused of being a sex criminal. You might think that surely it is a shock and a devastation to wake up, to find oneself transformed into a demon, into a thing, into an unspeakable thing, a frightening thing. No, it's wonderful, because... It is not that you change, it is that others change. You stay the same, but now you have a gift. You now have a superpower, the superpower of the accused. The superpower is to reveal the true characters of others. Who does not long from childhood for such a power? To understand the true nature of one's friends. We are not judges, we are the accused, but the people and states around us are. Great characters rise and great cultures step forward to shine. False smiles fade, concealed alliances are revealed, the timid retreat, and love is no longer merely a word, but it is an action. This is the superpower of the accused. Deep. Get out of my head, chat box. Well, I don't know. Guess, uh, I'm just going to go off on a rant. Um... Regulation in the last couple of months has really just hit a new pitch everywhere. Um, tax authorities going after blanket records, um, a country mandating the use of a national mining pool, um, even just the in between the lines reading of the comptroller's stablecoin interpretations that banks are only explicitly cleared to host reserves for custodial hosted stable coin wallets. Um, yeah, the, those, those wagons are starting to circle around and, you know, it's really time to start thinking comprehensively about how to deal with that and not in terms of just, well, if I use this mixer, my coins are fine. Or if, I buy my coins from a no KYC exchange that guarantees every interaction I have on Bitcoin is okay. Like these, like everything in Bitcoin will erode at different layers of the stack. And if people only think about dealing with this circular or circling regulation at one layer of the stack or only where they directly interact with things, that's not going to stop potential decay at other layers. And that that really needs to start sinking in, in my opinion, in terms of mindset about 
things going forward the next decade. On that note, join the Clusterfuck Club, where we fuck with clustering everywhere. Boom, boom. All right. Well, I guess uh, on that note, uh, punks, no more regular episodes uh, for the next two weeks, but maybe we'll squeeze in an interview or or something here and there. But uh, until next season, catch you later, punks. Auf Wiedersehen. Yeah, you have to